I like to meet. I like to meet my next wife to have that kind of devotion as that dog. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get married. <laughs> I'll tell you that. No, 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 I'm going to get up and talk. So. Yes. Our next lecturer really needs no introduction. The topic is crucial to what we're trying to do here over the next couple of days and what the Academy has been trying to do for 14 years. And basically that's the importance of infections in the life and times of humans. Our next lecturer is Dr. Garth Nicholson, PhD. He really needs no introduction, and of course I would hope that most of you, if not all of you, should know that his expertise is in the, he's noted for the Gulf War syndrome and his diagnosis and treatment, but he, that's just a dabbling of what he does. He has a PhD from US, uh, USC San Diego. He has written over 500 medical papers. I don't know, I, I haven't even read that many. He sits on 12 editorial boards and is editor of two professional magazines. I'd like to introduce Dr. Garth Nicholson, and his title of his uh, discussion will be Identification and Treatment of Infections in Chronic Disease States. And please pay attention, this is critical. All right, we've got a laser printer here, we've got the mic. Okay, and a dog. <laughs> two dogs. Um, you can hold them for just a second here. Well, it's a pleasure to, to be here and, and speak with you. And I think it's, it's a particular pleasure for me to address the American Academy of Biological Dentistry because so many chronic patients have dental problems. In fact, uh, if we look at the patients that we deal with, these are patients that have uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia syndrome, Gulf War illness, rheumatoid arthritis, and so on and so forth. Uh, some of these patients, as was mentioned earlier, seem to have their first occurrence of this illness possibly because of dental problems. At least the timing is certainly there. And, and we have been working on the infectious nature of this. And obviously this doesn't explain everything. But we feel that there are sizable subsets of patients in all these categories that have chronic infectious disease. Now when I mean chronic infectious disease, these are not your usual acute infections with things like bacteria that you can easily recognize, identify, and treat with a standard protocol of uh, 10 to 14 days of antibiotics and they go away and everybody's fine. These in tend to be infections that are intracellular, things like Lyme's disease, spirochetes, or mycoplasma that we deal a lot with, or chlamydia, extremely resistant to, to most antibiotics and it takes a long time to rid the system of these types of infections. And so that's what I'm going to concentrate on today. Now if I could have the slides. I did want to uh, mention that I'm actually representing three different institutions here today. Uh, the first is the Institute for Molecular Medicine, and this is our nonprofit uh, research institute of, of which I'm the head of. And it's uh, really dedicated to uh, new research on the diagnosis and therapy of chronic illnesses, a variety of chronic illnesses. And in fact, most of the illnesses that are causing us problems these days seem to be chronic. Now to do this work, we had to establish a certified diagnostic laboratory, which is certified here in California, as Medicare certified, so on and so forth. This diagnostic laboratory was set up to help in the identification of a variety of diseases, at least the chronic uh, infectious nature of these diseases so that adequate treatments could be undertaken. And finally, just recently, we've set up a uh, hyperbaric medical practice uh, located about a mile from, from the Institute and the Diagnostic Center. And this uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapeutic center is an integrated 
medical practice. So it uses not only hyperbaric oxygen and traditional medical approaches and in some that are, are considered alternative medical approaches as well. And the reason that we had to do this is that there were so many patients that were going to uh, conventional uh, internal medicine or infectious disease types and were not recovering from their illnesses. And, and the reason for that, we think, is that it required really an integrated approach or requires an integrated approach for many of these patients to get better. So now I'm going to try and go through some of these slides. So you all know that uh, chronic uh, diseases are a major problem. And we've kind of concentrated on the, the ones that are in blue, uh, basically because these cause a tremendous economic impact on our society and other societies as well. Now, uh, a lot of our uh, hypotheses on the origin of these uh, illnesses really come from the Gulf War and what happened in the Gulf War. And that kind of was a laboratory for us, uh, as I'll go into, to figure out what a lot of these chronic illnesses are due to. But basically, they're due to multiple insults. And in fact, this simple diagram here just is only one of many scenarios, by the way. This one is just a chemical scenario where a chemical exposure uh, sets up a patient. Uh, but if it's only the chemicals causing the problem, they could have, uh, for example, multiple chemical sensitivity syndrome, or if they're organophosphates, they could have organophosphate-induced delayed neuro neuropathy or something like this. But uh, that's not the only thing that can happen. Uh, if infections also play a role, and often patients, if they're chemically exposed or immunosuppressed, uh, then those infections can take hold as well. And uh, obviously, this depends upon the right uh, genetic predisposition. Differences in immunity, for example, or differences in the ability to detoxify uh, oneself, uh, probably, and many, thing, many other things as well, uh, determine to a degree whether one patient will get sick and another one might recover from these insults. But basically, we're talking about multiple toxic insults of a variety of different sorts. That's just one example, a chemical example. So these are complex illnesses that have a complex origin. And every patient is probably has a unique uh, scenario in which they were uh, exposed. Uh, some may have gotten heavy metal exposures, for example. Some may have gotten chemical exposures. Some may have gotten had acute viral illness and, and so on. But what we're talking about are chronic illnesses that evolve after the acute exposure. And in many cases, after the acute exposure is gone or, or the acute exposure, the, the, the offending elements are removed, the patient is still not recovering. The patient is progressively getting sicker and sicker. And it's a very slow process. And so these are the chronic illnesses that we deal with. Now today, I'm going to talk about some borderline anaerobes and their role in causing these types of chronic infections. And so this is a very short list of some of the things that we worry about. And of course, you'll recognize the uh, Lyme disease, uh, spirochete Borrelia. But we also work on mycoplasma, chlamydia, rickettsia, coxiella, and a number of other things that we're interested in as well. But the reason we're interested in these types of microorganisms is they're slow growing, they're borderline anaerobic, so they can find their way into places like bones and, and cavitation sites that you're all very interested in. And even in the absence of a uh, circulation or adequate circulation, circulatory system, they can grow and thrive and cause problems and produce toxins and so on and so forth that cause systemic effects. So uh, that's a very good reason for being interested in these types of things. Uh, these microorganisms do cause patient morbidity. So they may not cause illness, but they can often cause morbidity in patients. So this just is reminds me that these types of organisms could either be causative for illness. They could be a cofactor in illness, like HIV AIDS, for example, where it's not necessarily the HIV virus that will kill people. It's all the other things that go along with it. And mycoplasma is one of the important infections that have been pro proposed to be a cofactor in HIV AIDS, mostly by uh, Luc Montagnier and his colleagues in Paris. Or they could be opportunistic. In many cases, we think they're opportunistic. Because of some particular insult that's occurred, some toxic insult, a patient uh, has their immune system suppressed, and these uh, opportunistic infections can then take hold, where normally they might be adequately dealt with uh, by the immune system. Now, in dentistry, I think this is particularly important because of the trauma that patients go through in many of the dental procedures. And a lot of these borderline anaerobes may be actually sitting in the oral cavity, not causing any problem, not causing disease or whatever. And then if a traumatic insult occurs, uh, we can uh, allow entry of these microorganisms uh, into the body, into the system. Now, if a patient 
has a completely uh, active immune system or they're completely healthy, this may be of no consequence whatsoever. They may totally recover from that brief period of, of uh, microorganism insult and, and there's no lasting effect at all. But if the patient in any way is, a, is immune suppressed or let's say they have other toxic exposures that cause them problems, then these types of microorganisms can take hold. And what was described this morning as, as, and is often in your, in your area described as focal disease can then become systemic disease. Now we consider the patients that we deal with uh, systemic disease patients. They don't just have a central focal infection, although you can find central focal infections, and often, by the way, they're, they're oral infections. They have systemic disease. You can find these types of infections throughout the body, and you do find them in, in areas where, uh, I, I guess, the, the most focal signs and symptoms are present. For example, if they have nephritis or something like that, and you take a biopsy, you can find them there. So we think that they're very important in causing disease, and they're very important in a variety of different uh, diseases that we see, chronic diseases. Respiratory diseases like chronic asthma, uh, chronic pneumonia, and so on. Um, virtually half of these uh, diseases uh, seem to have a very important element of these chronic infections, like, for example, mycoplasmal infections. You find it in about half of, of chronic asthma patients, that is systemically in these chronic asthma patients. Rheumatoid diseases, we just published a paper in the British Journal of Rheumatology on this, about half of, of the uh, rheumatic disease patients uh, have these types of infections. And they don't just have one infection, they have multiple infections. And I think that's the theme of my story today, is that we're not dealing with one infection, we're dealing with multiple infections. And this complicates the story because each patient probably has a different collection of these multiple infections. And this makes it awfully difficult to treat if you have no idea whatsoever of the different types of, of infections. And I'm sure somebody in the audience will, will jump up and say, well, what about this type of infection? What about that type of infection? And my only response would be yes, yes, yes. Because you know, the further we look into this, the more complicated the picture becomes. So yes, there are multiple infections. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the fatigue syndromes, uh, particularly since uh, we got involved, uh, as, as was mentioned, in Gulf War illness, fibromyalgia syndrome, chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, these are awfully interesting illnesses which are skyrocketing in incidence uh, at the moment. It, not necessarily Gulf War illness, but certainly the others which are found in the civilian population. But Gulf War illness is essentially chronic fatigue syndrome, as we published a, a number of years ago. Uh, gastrointestinal orders, such as the inflammatory bowel diseases, uh, this is a very prominent uh, component of inflammatory bowel diseases. We're doing two studies with uh, two German hospitals. Uh, on this, and we find chronic infections in a majority of these patients, and when they're treated appropriately, uh, they alleviate uh, much of the signs and symptoms. So again, we think it's quite important there. Obviously, GU disorders, that's been known for some time, uh, sinus infections, cutaneous disorders, and so on. Uh, autoimmune diseases, I'm very interested in autoimmune diseases because of the potential role for these multiple infections uh, to, to play, I think, a, a, vital, uh, uh, or vitally involved in the etiologic process of, etiologic process of things like uh, MS, ALS, uh, SLE, Graves' disease, which of course is an autoimmune disease of the thyroid and so on and so forth. Now often you, we will see patients that are chronically ill that have, let's say, been diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome, but they'll have signs and symptoms of many of the autoimmune disorders. They'll have some rheumatoid, or rheumatic disease signs and symptoms. Some people will have Graves disease signs and symptoms. Some people will have lupus signs and symptoms and so on. Uh, we think that, uh, that there's a reason for this with these, because of these chronic infections because they tend to set up an autoimmune disorder by their very nature. And I'll get back to that in a moment because these infections do have the capacity to trigger autoimmune reactions. Uh, in your system. Now, I'll mention one thing here because it's kind of interesting, ALS patients, because we've identified at least two types of infections in 100% of ALS patients, and we haven't seen any one that falls out of that uh, pattern, and that leads me to believe that these are really quite important. Now, the genetic background, of course, is, is very important, too, and may decide whether that patient really becomes an, an ALS patient or not. What are they? Beg your pardon? I'll, get, I'll, I'll come back to that, actually. But one of them is a mycoplasmal infection that we find in 100% of ALS patients so far tested. And of course, you know about the var various uh, diseases that involve uh, your particular specialty, and so I'm not going to really concentrate on that. 
I, did, I do want to say something about the bone infections because we are uh, a bit interested in bone infections because these often are infections that we were discussing before the, the presentation that get walled off. Uh, they're not very uh, accessible uh, by the immune system. They're, they're often poorly vascularized and so on. So they're, they're often infections that are extremely difficult to deal with systemically. That is with uh, even IV antibiotics in many cases won't dent these types of infections. So that's why in many cases in your business you go right after the infection and remove the foci of infection and then treat. And, and I think that I had that done myself. And uh, we can come back to that after in the, in the question and answer period. But uh, in my case, from ha probably handling all the samples uh, initially when we were dealing with uh, Gulf War illness patients and not knowing what we were dealing with at all, I probably got infected myself. And I ended up essentially with Gulf War illness. Uh, the cardiac diseases, uh, of course, now there's a, an explosive amount of information that's just coming out on, on the role of chlamydia and mycoplasma and other types of infections in heart disease. And so there's a, a subset of uh, heart disease uh, patients in which these infections are very prominent. And these are often the patients where you see uh, a slight swelling of the heart, uh, irregularities, and so on and so forth uh, in, in the rhythms of the heart and, and, and uh, the, electric, the electrical circuitry of the heart and so on. And these are candidates for these types of infections. And we often find that those types of patients uh, have these infections. And the immunosuppressive diseases, such as cancer and AIDS and so on. Anywhere where the immune system is suppressed, and this could occur because of heavy metal exposure, this could occur because of radiation exposure, this could occur because of chemical exposure, these patients are, are wide open for, for opportunistic infections. And this is only a short list, I think, of, of the types of areas. Now I'm going to go back to the Gulf War because uh, this is how, in a way, we kind of got started uh, in this. At the time, I was a department head at the MD Anderson uh, Cancer Center, and we, and we were dealing uh, primarily with, with cancer patients. And then my daughter, who, who served in the Gulf War, came back. And uh, she was uh, uh, training to be a pilot when the war broke out. And so she was not deployed as a pilot. But when she came back from the war, she tried to complete her pilot training. And her health started failing. And no one could seem to help her. They were denying that there were any health effects if you served in the Gulf War and so on. Well, she came down with a degenerative disease, which resulted in her not only uh, failing to qualify as a, as a pilot, but she left the military. She's now a third year medical student at Northwestern and will be a neurologist, hopefully, in a few years. And so for, in her case, it worked out OK. She just simply made a career change. But in many cases, it didn't turn out OK because many of these soldiers came down sick and then their family members came down sick. And all the while, this was being denied. So just to remind you what happened in, in 1991 uh, in the Gulf, there were about 575,000 US forces deployed, but they weren't the only ones deployed. There were 28 other uh, members of the coalition uh, that uh, invaded the Kuwait and southern Iraq. Now, officially, there were only 148 uh, US uh, soldiers killed in action, mainly during the ground defensive in 1991. But since then, there have been thousands of deaths up to 1994, there were 7,000. Now this is over two or three times that number, although the exact number is classified. And you wonder, well, how come nobody knows about this? And that's because it's all been kept very quiet. There are over 100,000 that have certified with Gulf War illness. That's one out of five deployed. And that's not even counting the family members. And there was a recent, uh, well, it's not even recent, there was a study in 1994 done by a, a US Senate committee that indicated that 77% of the spouses and 65% of the children born after the war were now showing the same signs and symptoms as the veteran itself. So we have a major problem on our hand. It looks like we've got something that's being transmitted into the population. And we've had uh, alarming uh, problems on many of the military bases. And if I just think about the calls that I've gotten from people on military bases, uh, it, it's been almost overwhelming, uh, the interest uh, in, in this particular area. And we get a lot of calls, by the way, from dentists who practice on military bases because many of these people that served in the Gulf War have tremendous dental problems when they, when they come back. So this is, a, this is a major problem. Now, during the Gulf War, uh, you might expect that if you have casualties, that those casualties would be in the frontline combat units that were involved in heavy combat, such as the uh, mechanized infantry and armored units that were attacking the Republican Guard uh, here in southern Iraq. 
And you don't expect casualties to occur in the units that are well behind the lines uh, back here in command and control, transportation, supply units, and so on. That's not what happened. Virtually every unit uh, that was over there uh, suffered uh, some sort of casualties that we call Gulf War illness. And it did not necessarily occur in the combat units. In fact, we think there were fewer casualties in the combat units than there were in the non-combat units. And you might think, how can that happen? Well, we're going to go into how that might have happened. Well, for years, they, of course, uh, the Department of Defense uh, and also the Ministry of Defense in Great Britain uh, refused to consider that if you were deployed to the Persian Gulf that, that there was any higher of incidence of illness than just somebody in the average population. And this is a study that the CDC did on Air Force Reserve units and Army Reserve units. They did a study actually on four units. These are two of the Air Force units from central Pennsylvania. And it was a case control study. So they compared units uh, in which half the members were deployed to the Persian Gulf and half remained behind in the community and they compared the two and if uh, they were deployed there in red and you can see the difference between the red bars and the yellow bars if you were deployed you had a much higher incidence of all these chronic signs and symptoms joint pain chronic fatigue memory loss sleep difficulties headaches skin rashes joint problems depression gastrointestinal problems diarrhea and the list goes on and on because most of these patients have between 40 and 60 signs and symptoms when you sit down and really analyze them so when we first started looking at this, we thought that, well, these were overlapping signs and symptoms. There was nothing that was entirely specific about this. Is it wasn't Gulf War syndrome. There was no unique syndrome associated with the Gulf War. These people were probably suffering from a chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia syndrome. And it included immediate family members, as I mentioned. There are probably multiple parent causes, just like we're talking about. These don't occur as, as individual or as unique uh, events, uh, or non-unique events, or each individual has different exposures to different toxic uh, materials, and so they end up with a slightly different uh, type of uh, disease. They're not all exactly the same. We didn't think they were uh, psychological disorders because at the time they were saying it's all due to stress, and in fact the, the data really doesn't support that, and there's a recent article in a psychiatric journal that they actually studied very carefully Gulf War illness patients and finally concluded for the first time the psychiatrist finally concluded the first time that uh, Gulf War illness did not fit this stress-related psychiatric disorder. So uh, we felt all along that these were due to chemical and biological and other toxic exposures, and I think that's going to turn out to be the true. And as I mentioned, uh, when we looked at the signs and symptoms of these, they looked very similar uh, to fibromyalgia syndrome and chronic fatigue syndrome. These two syndromes are overlapping entirely in their signs and symptoms profile. And if you look at these, uh, so you know, how do you tell them apart? Well, in fibromyalgia syndrome, uh, the main difference is if a patient comes in and their primary complaints are muscle pain, weakness, and tenderness, and they have all these trigger points of sensitivity in their body, they'll generally get a, a diagnosis of fibromyalgia syndrome. But if another patient could come in with a completely the, the same type of a profile, but their major complaints would be chronic fatigue, joint pain, and sometimes swollen lymph nodes, they'll probably get a diagnosis of chronic fatigue syndrome. Other than that, the signs and symptoms are completely overlapping. So we think that these two are, are very related. They're very related disorders. In fact, when we start looking at these in detail, we can see that they're highly related. So we wanted to find out some information in, in the Gulf from the Gulf War about where these people served in the Gulf, what they were exposed to, and so on and so forth. So we came up with a very detailed illness survey form, and uh, we wanted to document as much as possible uh, what happened to them. And finally, when you go down the list, we get down here to the bottom, and after below listing chemical and environmental toxic exposures, uh, we wanted to know their vaccinations, and there we hit a stone wall because uh, they were telling us, well, I'm sorry, but the shot records of, of these people have disappeared, or they were classified, or whatever. Then it turns out they, they, they claimed at the time that 400,000 shot records had disappeared. And they had no evidence or couldn't find them. And I don't think anybody really believed them on that. And so uh, they've had to scramble a lot in the meantime to try and uh, uh, you know, rectify that situation. And we're going through it uh, still. Well, if you look at these signs and symptoms, and here we've put 120 different signs and symptoms into about 30 categories. So you can, you can see them here, and it's not uh, too important here. All these people have multiple problems, and this is just the incidence of these multiple problems. For example, in any one different category, if you take depression or memory or balance, again, multiple uh, elements make up each of these categories. 
if we look at, at chronic fatigue syndrome or go for illness, the first two bars here at the top, you can't really distinguish the difference in colors, but it doesn't really matter because they're almost the same. Compared to family members that now show signs and symptoms, and they look very similar. The only thing that looks different is if you look at chronic illnesses which, in which there, we can't identify any type of infectious origin or infectious agent associated with it, and then we start to see differences. These are the green bars. In many ca categories, you don't see problems uh, in these. Uh, now here, we, for example, we have dental, dental problems and so on, and, and there you, you don't see any, any uh, you, you don't see the, the patients that, that have chronic illness that are not associated with these categories that are related. And again, uh, this is just the same thing in many categories. If, if they have chronic illness with no evidence of infection, they don't fit the pattern uh, compared to all the rest. So the problem is, how do you find these infections? Because basically, these infections uh, are difficult to find. They're not obvious, even with blood tests. Most of the infections that we look for are intracellular. They're buried deep in the tissues. They may be in the bone, for example. They're not freely floating around, uh, so they're hard to find. And, and normally, when you, when you send a sample in for uh, just normal blood workup, these types of patients, everything looks pretty normal unless the patient has really progressed, in which there's a little asterisk here. As many of these uh, diseases progress, then things change from, from normal to abnormal. But generally, they look, everything looks normal until the patient becomes highly progressed. Until you get down to start looking in detail at things like immune function, then all of a sudden, uh, some parameters uh, come up uh, abnormal. Then if you start looking in more detail at immune function, you find that they often have activated uh, viruses. Uh, it's not to say that something like uh, EB virus is involved necessarily in these illnesses. We think that a lot of these people that have EB, like we almost all of us do, 95% of us have EB virus, that the reason why they're activated is our immune systems are depressed. When our immune systems are depressed, if you've got any latent viruses, these are gonna, titers are gonna come up, these viruses are gonna come out. So we think a lot of these uh, latent viruses uh, come up because of immune system abnormalities. And some of these immune system abnormalities can be seen in terms of the cytokine profiles. They change in these patients. So there are changes in interleukin-2, interferon, and, and, and IL-12, and so on and so forth. And in fact, at the bottom there, you can find infections in these patients, which may uh, be important in their illness. Now, going back to the Gulf War, there are several proposals that were put out uh, as to why these people got sick. For example, mixtures of chemicals, sand inhalation, depleted uranium, parasites, or we proposed uh, systemic infections. And the one category that uh, really only fits with systemic, inf or only fits with this category, systemic infections, is the fact that uh, in some of these patients, they're contagious, they spread the illness to their family members. So you'd expect that in those cases, we should find a transmittable element, and that's got to be something uh, that uh, is infectious. So that's not to say that we can explain every case of a Gulf War illness. These are really, uh, it's a very broad category, and there are multiple uh, disease states in that broad category. So we're dealing with the subset of patients who have transmittable illnesses. And I want to make that clear, that this doesn't explain everything. So in these patients, we're looking for viruses, bacteria, and we were very interested in a subclass of bacteria called mycoplasma. And the reason we were interested in that uh, like uh, Borrelia and other types of uh, microorganisms, uh, they have the capacity to enter into cells. And when they enter into cells, they're kind of sequestered away from the immune system. They can hide from the immune system. But once cells, uh, once these uh, primitive bacteria like mycoplasma are inside cells, they can release toxic elements that affect our energy metabolism, for example, that affect intercellular metabolism, that can affect uh, genetic, uh, uh, not only genetic organization, genetic activity, gene expression, so on and so forth, or even gene mutation, because they give off uh, uh, toxic, genotoxic substances. So these are little uh, microorganisms that can really modify cells. And in doing so, uh, they can cause a host of other problems. Now, how are they related to autoimmune problems? Well, when this type of microorganism, which doesn't have a rigid cell wall, escapes from a cell, it actually fuses with the plasma membrane of the cell, and when it's released, it carries some of the host antigens with it. Now, this is quite different from a virus, because when a virus buds from a cell, it is so compact that it virtually excludes all of the host membrane antigens, so you only have viral antigens when the virion is released. That's not true with things like mycoplasma. When they're released from cells, they carry host antigens with them. 
if you have any functioning capacity in your immune system at all, you can then respond to the mycoplasma, and then you might also respond to these host antigens. They also have what's known as super antigens, and they also have some antigen mimicry. One of the ways mycoplasma have escaped the immune system over the years is they've evolved a way to produce antigens or change antigens on their surface so that they mimic host antigens, so they're very similar to host antigens. Now, they're not exactly the same, and of course this can result in, in uh, an autoimmune situation as well. So mycoplasmas virtually can cause all of those signs and symptoms that, that I mentioned before. They can cause fevers, uh, cutaneous problems, uh, joint problems, uh, cardiac problems, gastrointestinal problems, visual problems. Uh, some of these are repeated. I just wanted to show you that, that uh, if it's severe, this can result, for example, in the liver in, in hepatitis. Uh, it can cause uh, spinal meningitis, uh, cerebral meningitis, for example. Um, it, all of these things can happen with these infections if they're allowed to progress. Now, most patients, they, they don't progress to that degree because they're kind of smoldering infections. They're very slowly proliferating infections, and these patients have a variety of different chronic problems, but it's not something that you can pin down. It's not so organ-specific. They don't just have nephritis, for example. And it's because of the slow-growing nature of these infectious agents in virtually any type of cell in the body. And, and when they get out, of course, they can, can be recognized by the immune system. But because they uh, carry uh, host antigens, this can set up an autoimmune response. Uh, and in, uh, also, it causes these changes in cytokines and interferons and so on. And so these chronically ill people um, have uh, unusual cytokine balances in some of the signs and symptoms that we see in these patients are probably due to their chronic immune responses. Now, how do you find these? Uh, these are often difficult uh, types of infections to find. Uh, a few years ago, we developed a technique called uh, nucleoprotein gene tracking in which we could find these uh, uh, types of infections. But now, for the clinical laboratory, we prefer a technique called forensic polymerase chain reaction. And it's different from the classical in that we actually isolate the DNA of the microorganism. And this is important because that DNA can, can be destroyed very quickly in the classical isolation procedures. I'm going to skip this because this is technical information. Now, we compared it to a technique called gene tracking where uh, we can look directly at specific genes in the nucleoproteins uh, in these both cells and microorganisms by isolating those complexes directly so that the DNA is complex in this case. It's not as susceptible to, to degradation by nucleases. And I'm not going to really go through this because it's a research technique. But here's what a blot looks like uh, if we were to use nucleoprotein gene tracking to identify, for example, a mycoplasmal infection. And this just happens to be a special forces uh, person who served in the Gulf and is very sick with Gulf War illness. And so by doing a number of repeated blots, we're able to identify, and this is just one of them, uh, this uh, marker for which is a, a mycoplasma nuclear transport protein gene, uh, and it happened to be in a nuclear component that uh, we knew had other mycoplasma genes in it. So we were able to type, in a way, the type of uh, mycoplasma that that particular soldier had in his system. The normal way that which this is done now in the laboratory is to use PCR, where we can amplify a unique segment of DNA. Uh, by utilizing two unique primers that flank this unique sequence. And by adding TAC polymerase, we can fill that in, and so we can make a complementary piece of DNA. And by heating it up, we can separate the complementary piece from the original DNA and repeat the whole process. And if you do this over and over again, and this is what a thermocycler does in a PCR reaction, you can amplify a million fold or more that little segment of DNA. Now, once you uh, do that, of course, you have to do more. One of the problems that we found initially on this is if you use conventional approaches, uh, it didn't work. Why? Because some of the DNA was complex with proteins, and the TAC polymerase wouldn't work. No cDNA would form, and you didn't get a PCR product. So we had to learn to isolate the DNA, and we used a technique called uh, Kelex formation purification. When you did that, you could very easily identify the DNA. Here are just some Desert Storm veterans in which we identified the, the uh, product of a PCR reaction. Uh, you can see a number of these have a product that's 717 base pairs in size. Once you identify this product, that's, uh, you don't stop there, although a lot of the commercial firms that, that do this stop at this point. But we've realized that it's absolutely imperative 
to either do sequencing or southern hybridization or do nested PCR to absolutely positively identify uh, the product. So this con the uh, confirmation of the PCR product is very important. And so we either do sequence analysis or southern hybridization or nested uh, pair hybridization to determine uh, the product and make sure that it is the correct sequence. And that turns out to be very important. Now these are what little mycoplasma look like inside a cell. In this case, uh, one of your white blood cells. And this is the source that we use. None of the mycoplasma that we test are actually free in the blood. They're always inside the leukocyte fraction of the blood. Uh, sometimes you can find them associated uh, with red blood cells, but usually they're with the leukocytes. Now, I think this quote is very important. It comes from Professor Gail Cassell, who's a, a mycoplasma expert who was at the University of Alabama. She was the department chairman down there. And this was from a review in JAMA, really on respiratory infections, where she stated that these types of infections are often misdiagnosed or they're not even looked for. And then when you find them, they're usually either not treated or inappropriately treated. And, and I think that's still true today, is that uh, often when these infections are found, uh, they're not treated correctly. So let's go back to some of the results that we found. When we looked at Gulf War illness patients, uh, we found that about half of them had evidence of mycoplasma, any species, in their blood. And almost all of these, 80% of these or more, were one species of mycoplasma, mycoplasma fermentans. And about 10% were mycoplasma genitalium. And actually, this number is even lower, mycoplasma pneumoniae. Now, uh, other people have said, for example, the Department of Veterans Affairs last year in, in, in uh, I think it was the Washington uh, Post, said, well, uh, this is not uh, very reliable or so. Well, um, I, dig, I beg to differ because just recently at the uh, NIH Chronic Fatigue Coordinating Board, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Chuck Engel of Walter Reed Armand Medical Center, who's a co-principal <laughs> investigator on a large, uh, uh, essentially, uh, study that's being conducted in the VA at 30 institutions around the country based on, on our diagnostic techniques and protocol, found exactly this. They looked at almost 600 patients and they got uh, almost exactly the same results that we did. So not only is it true, but it's been confirmed by the Department of Defense and Department of Veterans Affairs using their own people. We weren't even involved. So they can't deny it any longer. This is a situation that many of those patients have these types of infections. How does that compare to civilians that have chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia syndrome? Well, again, a lot of these, about 60 to 65 percent, have these infections. And again, you see things like mycoplasma fermentans as a prominent component. But you also see other types of infections, like mycoplasma hominis, for example. Uh, mycoplasma pneumoniae is probably the most uh, commonly found one. And you notice that these bars don't equal 65%. And that's because most of these patients have multiple infections. So this is really quite different from what we saw in the Gulf War illness patients. More than 80% of them, if we look for mycoplasma, had only one type of infection, mycoplasma fermentans. When we look at civilians that have been sick for a long time, and generally these are a few years of illness, they have multiple infections. In fact, we just published in a European Infectious Disease Journal that if these patients have been sick over six years, almost all of them have multiple mycoplasmal infections. And they have other infections as well. They have chlamydia infections, and this could go on and on and on. So the patients that have been sick over a decade, uh, they have the most complex uh, infection profile that you could imagine with these multiple infections. And that's why these patients never get well. A patient that has had something like chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia syndrome for over six to 10 years, fewer than 8% of them ever recover from their illness. And I think that's one of the reasons why. Now let's take an autoimmune disease like rheumatoid arthritis. About half of these patients also have mycoplasmal infections. And you find the infection in the joint. And we've been doing some studies on this with an orthopedic uh, surgeon. And in fact, where you find the blood infection, you find the infection in their joints, particularly the joints that are causing the problems. And again, multiple infections. The profiles are a little bit different from chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia syndrome, but basically they're the same. And in fact, if you look carefully at the signs and symptoms of all these patients, and generally, they're overlapping. So even though you, you might get a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis, if you start looking at all the other problems in those patients, they fit more than just the definition of rheumatoid arthritis. They also tend to fit other definitions as well. Now this just shows that <coughs> patients with chronic fatigue syndrome, <coughs> excuse me,
excuse me, fibromyalgia syndrome have multiple infections. In this study that was just published, um, almost all of them had multiple infections. And this can be two infections, three infections, or more. And we're just looking at mycoplasmas in this test. If you start looking at other infections as well, and we've started to add chlamydia on top of this, and you know, when, when you start to add, I'm sure as we start to go down and we start to add fungi and other things, all of a sudden the, the picture will probably be extremely complex, particularly in these patients that have been sick for a long period of time. And I'm not going to go through this. Other labs have confirmed our results, and they get almost exactly the same as we do. So uh, I'm not going to bother you with that. But these are details that people used to harass us with uh, in the early days. Now, <coughs> there are some other interesting things that, that happened, I think, that point towards uh, these sorts of infections as being important in chronic illness. And I'll give you another example. I gave the example of the Gulf War. Here's an example that's a little more focal. In 1992, an El Al flight uh, took off from the United States uh, bound for Israel. It refueled at Scopel uh, Airfield in outside of Amsterdam, took off, two engines failed, it crashed, killed 43 people, and uh, caused a lot of uh, problems. But the real problems were only beginning because now there are some 2,000 people in the crash area that are sick with chronic illnesses. And if you look at the signs and symptoms of those people, they look very much like Gulf War illness or chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia syndrome, advanced cases. Now, here's where the problem gets kind of sticky because uh, originally when that flight uh, crashed, of course, they were trying to get the manifest and El Al <coughs> described the manifest as perfumes and machine parts, but later when they started analyzing some of the chemicals involved, they found precursors of sarin, which is a chemical warfare agent. They found depleted uranium, which of course is used in armor penetrating uh, weapons. And they found unknown materials. Some of these were microbiological materials because they were in little vials, sealed vials and so on. Uh, which, you know, they had the, the, you know, you always tag something in the laboratory for shipment. If it's a biohazard, for example, it has a very specific symbol uh, on the container and so on and so forth. So the Israeli Defense Ministry uh, declined to disclose the contents uh, of these uh, mystery uh, contents for national security reasons. But we do know one thing. Uh, we know where some of these materials were headed for because that did appear on the cargo list. And they were headed for Nesayana. Nesayana is the Israeli Defense Force uh, Biological Center south of Tel Aviv. So obviously they were shipping things from the United States to a biological weapons unit of the IDF. And so uh, you might wonder what those units were. Well, of course, there's a lot of problems uh, associated with helping these patients now because the Dutch government really doesn't want to deal with this. Because, uh, of course, uh, Netherlands is a member of NATO, and NATO got involved in this, and caused it, the whole thing was a mess. Anyway, we did laboratory tests now on 28 of these patients, not the 19 that are shown here. When, we, um, when I made this slide up, 13 out of 19 were positive for uh, mycoplasma fermentans. That was the most prominent infection that we found. And now it's like uh, 22 out of 28 or something like that. So it's the same percentage. We just looked at more patients. Now, we also compared these to chronic fatigue syndrome patients in Utrecht, which is about 50 kilometers away. So these are patients that have somewhat similar signs and symptoms. Did we find the same infection? No, we didn't. We actually found other mycoplasma, but we didn't find a high frequency of mycoplasma fermentan. So we think something is, is wrong here. There's another thing that kind of points to that. And basically, there were three groups of patients uh, that came out of this crash that had chronic illness. There were the uh, emergency personnel that fought the fires and, and helped the people and so on and so forth. And the residents of the crash site, the areas, these, uh, some of these people, of course, have chronic illness. But this third group was very interesting because they were nowhere near the crash site. The only association they have with a crash is that they worked in Hangar 8 at Scopel Airfield. Hangar 8 was where they reassembled the parts from the crash. You know, after every crash, they try and figure out what made the plane crash. So, they choose a hangar somewhere, they reassemble the aircraft in the hangar, and the people that worked in this hangar then became sick, and they had the same signs and symptoms as the other people, and when we tested them, they had the same types of infections. So we think that something's very wrong here, but it'll take a while, I think, to sort it out. Now, no matter how people got these infections, uh, we have to figure out what we're going to do about it, because they're very, very difficult to treat. And, and they require really a comprehensive, uh, I think, integrated uh, approach to treatment. If you find these types of infections, the front line <coughs> is really long-term antibiotic therapy. 
And we've gone through a few antibiotics. Uh, we first started with doxycycline, and, and the Department of Veterans Affairs is using this protocol, doxycycline, 200 milligrams per day. But there's some other antibiotics that have to be used in the course of, of therapy of these patients. And, and this, the reason for this may be that there are multiple infections. This is not the only infection that these patients have. But if we're just talking about mycoplasmas or other intracellular infections, they're often slow growing. Because they're inside cells in an intracellular location, they're not so easily acceptable or accessible uh, to things like antibiotics or uh, immune priming of the patient, immune stimulation, and so on. They, in fact, they, they have an inherent insensitivity to a variety of drugs. So generally, multiple cycles of treatment or long-term therapy is really required. So now we just say flat out that patients that have these infections and have, have a chronic illness should be treated a minimum of six months uh, with antibiotics and, and using other therapies as well as I'll come back to. And the reason for this is kind of shown here. It's a study we did of Special Forces and Navy SEALs that served in the Gulf War. This is a very unique study because all of these people remained in the military because they were professional soldiers and we had physicians in those units take care of them so they could do the assessment. So these are about 75 uh, Special Forces and Navy SEALs and we uh, subjected them to a number of cycles of doxycycline. And remember that these are our are, are most elite members of the U.S. Armed Forces. These people are so highly trained you wouldn't believe it. When they were deployed to the Persian Gulf uh, during the Gulf War, uh, again, they were all in good health. Every, every soldier, every sailor, every Marine, every airman that was deployed had to pass a physical to go to the Persian Gulf. So we knew that they were in excellent health when they were deployed. They came back, they came down with a variety of, of different illnesses. These people, which uh, I think recovered probably faster than anybody group that we've ever seen, took up to five to six cycles, six week cycles to recover. And in fact, that's why we now say minimum six months of therapy before you know, you'll get significant uh, rates of recovery. And that's particularly true of civilians who are not as in good a shape as these people were. So that was part of actually con my congressional testimony because I've testified now six times to, to Congress, presidential committees, DOD oversight committees and so on. And they're finally getting the idea because the Department of Veterans Affairs uh, set up a large uh, $6 million clinical trial where they took Gulf War illness patients and using our tests, they confirmed if they had mycoplasmal infections and then randomized them to uh, doxycycline, 200 milligrams per day versus placebo. Uh, and then after uh, essentially one year, 12 months of therapy, they're to come back and uh, be retested. And then if they're negative, they're put in another trial. So this, this is only one of two of the treatment trials that have come out of the whole Gulf War illness program. And that's a $121 million program, most of it psychiatrists trying to figure out what's wrong with these people uh, rather than helping them. Uh, and I mentioned that uh, the preliminary uh, results uh, are uh, just as we thought, that 40% uh, of these patients were mycoplasma positive. Over 80% of that 40 had mycoplasma fermentans. The other 10% mycoplasma genitalium, which is kind of an unusual mycoplasma to see uh, as a systemic infection. Now, the reason we think that these infections are uh, difficult to treat is that just antibiotics alone are not enough. We know that uh, proper nutrition really is important in these patients. Uh, we found in the study with Bill Ray in, in Dallas at the Environmental Health Center that they have poor capacity, for example, to absorb B-complex vitamins. So we, we recommend sublingual B-complex, uh, extra CE, CoQ10 is very important, minerals. We were talking about selenium a while back. Selenium is a very important mineral to put in. In fact, selenium will suppress uh, mycoplasma. And there are other reasons those of you in dentistry uh, might look to something like selenium because of its ability to complex heavy metals. Now, we also know that uh, we have to get these people off of refined sugar, uh, caffeine, alcohol, high-fat diets, and so on. You have to get them into more natural foods. And what's very important in these patients as well is that they have to get on probiotics. Uh, Lactobacillus acidophilus and all the other variants of this are very, very important to maintain the proper uh, balance in the gut. Um, otherwise, uh, these patients won't absorb foods properly. Uh, they'll have uh, inflammatory bowel disease and a number of different problems. So that tends to help with that. Uh, and there are a variety of other infections, as I mentioned. Uh, fungal and yeast and other bacterial infections in these patients 
are very, very important. And this is kind of the tip of the iceberg. What we found and reported, I think, is just the beginning because these are complex patients that have a variety of different uh, infections. Now, nutritional recommendations, uh, I'm not going to go into this, but there are a number of immune enhancement natural products or natural antimicrobial products that in individual patients might be very useful. And some, even some natural remedies. We don't rule anything out. We, we try anything if it's, uh, if it's appropriate. We're concentrating now in applying, uh, along with our other therapies, oxidative therapy, particularly hyperbaric oxygen. And I put on the back table there a brochure from uh, our newest uh, medical practice that we've established, which is a hyperbaric medicine integrated practice. So we're using that. In fact, we've just presented a protocol to the Surgeon General of the Army to utilize uh, hyperbaric oxygen along with other modalities to treat Gulf War illness. And some of these others have, have proved uh, useful. For example, we recommended hydrogen peroxide baths mainly because they're simple and easy to do. Not very effective, but they're certainly cheap and easy to do. Ozone therapy is illegal in this state. Uh, some people have benefited from that, but in California you have to go to Nevada to be treated with ozone therapy. IV peroxide therapy can be very dangerous, and so uh, in general, we're leaning towards hyperbaric oxygen is, is the way to go. Now, I'm not going to go into this. I mean, we've published a number of papers uh, showing the efficacy of, of this uh, type of therapy, and I'm not going to, these are all published, and, and most of, a lot of the references are, are available. I think my clicker here is running out. On the internet? Yes. In fact, in my last slide, I'm going to try and finish as I may have over time. My last slide, I'll, I'll give you our website, and, and a lot of these things are can be downloaded from our, from our website, a lot of these current um, publications. I did want to mention a study that we did with the Shasta Cephids group in Northern California because this was a group of long-term, chronically ill patients of which we tested many of them for uh, mycoplasmal infections and also some of the other people tested them that we trained. Uh, we took the ones that were positive for these infections and they were put on a regimen of doxycycline and some of the other antibiotics and 80% of these recovered from 50 to 100% of their, their pre-sickness health uh, on the antibiotics and the supplements that, that we proposed. And even some of the ones that were mycoplasma negative were uh, benefited from this, not the same high percentage. And that suggests that, again, there are other infections that we're not diagnosing that are present in many of the patients as well. And if I had to guess on how many chronically ill patients of this category had the chronic infections as a major source of their morbidity, not necessarily the cause of their illness, but the cause of their present morbidity, it's probably going to be as high as, as uh, 80%. The problem is that we can't identify all these infections. We can begin to identify a few of them now, and that's what we've been, been trying to do. Once they're identified, of course, this gives us a marker to follow those patients. Now, people always ask me, well, how do you know that something like mycoplasmas that we've identified are actually causing the illness or causing morbidity. In fact, there are a set of criteria that, that are used here. And this was all published in clinical and infectious diseases. The incidence rate in disease patients has to be higher, and we've shown this. You have to recover more of the uh, infectious agent from disease patients, and we've shown this. In some cases, you, can, you should get an antibody response, but these intracellular bacteria like chlamydia, mycoplasma, and so on, do not elicit a strong immune response. In fact, they hide from the immune system. They're very adept at this. You should get, if you have a clinical response, elimination of mycoplasma, and we've shown this. I kind of glossed over that. But if you treat a patient and they recover, uh, you find no evidence of the infection that you found before. The antibiotic response uh, should be differential. That is, it should be related to the appropriate antibiotic. And this is what you see. In fact, if you give the wrong antibiotic, you can often make the patients worse. Uh, we've seen this, for example, at Camp Pendleton, right after the Gulf War, there were 600 cases of anaphylaxis with penicillin in people that were not allergic to penicillin. And I don't necessarily think they were uh, anaphylaxis patients. I think what happens is they had an adverse response to the penicillin, possibly because they had these other infections, these other cell wallace infections in their system, and they just went wild when you knocked down the other types of infections. Now, the most interesting uh, criteria here are the animal models. If you take uh, any number of different animal models and inject them with something like mycoplasma fermentans, it's a lethal disease. Those animals have a slowly progressive illness that results in 100% lethality. And I think the, the, I think the, the best example, uh, of course, are in, in non-human primates. 
So if you take rhesus monkeys, for example, or silver leaf monkeys, and inject them with mycoplasma fermentans, they will slowly develop a chronic illness showing many of the patterns of uh, autoimmune disturbance and all of the types of signs and symptoms that I showed you, some 20 to 40 or 60 different signs and symptoms if you can measure them in those, in those uh, non-human patients. And eventually those animals die, all of them die. So that is the difference. Now this is why, uh, in fact, those studies showed why antibodies uh, can't be used because those animals didn't start making antibodies against the mycoplasma until about a month or two before they died. So this is a process that takes a couple years. It's a very slow evolving process. So you, there's some things that come out of that that are, that are very interesting. Now these are two that we don't know too much about. One is human testing. And one of the things that uh, you know, you'd like to see is if you put mycoplasma in a human, it causes the same disease. And this is, of course, an not an ethical experiment to do, but uh, we feel that it has been done. I got into a lot of trouble in Texas because we reported that in the prison system that they were using uh, volunteers, prisoners, they were treating them with aerosols of mycoplasma, and they were, getting, they were coming down sick and dying, and then the prison guards got sick, and then their families got sick. In other words, the level of transmission that we saw from the Gulf War was occurring in, in selected prisons in East Texas. And boy, did I open up a hornet's nest when I got involved in this. And I've, but I've since got an apology from the governor on this, so who will probably be our next president. So we know that we were correct on that. They called me a liar down there for saying that this happened. But some of the family members who were involved in this whole process actually went and dug out the files from the prison board uh, hearings to prove that they had approved mycoplasmal experiments, aerosols of mycoplasma to be given to prisoners. And they managed to destroy six copies uh, of all, six sets of all these documents, but they forgot, they left one in a basement in Austin. And these moms, we call them, because they were all mothers and they all had members of their families that were sick, managed to, to get in the basement and dig through thousands and thousands of documents and find them. So there's a lot of uh, uh, problems uh, that are going on behind the scenes that, that we don't know too much about. In the case of the Gulf War, it's a very complicated uh, problem because they could have gotten these infections from the vaccines. In fact, I've just, uh, there'll be an article coming out in the Medical Sentinel on this in about a month, another article in an infectious disease newsletter. Uh, we've been asking for years to test the vaccines that were used in the Gulf War. And of course, they don't want anything to do with that because we might find these infections in the vaccines. And in fact, if you look at vaccines, commercial vaccines in general, there are some publications on commercial vaccines that show, one case showed as high as 7.5% of the commercial vaccines are contaminated with mycoplasma. And nobody knows about this because they're buried in the, in the, uh, in the literature, in the scientific literature, and, and you really have to dig to get those things out, but they're there. So uh, in the case of the Gulf War, where 20 to 30 different uh, vaccinations were given in, in a two to three day period, this results in immunosuppression, classic immunosuppression, vaccine-induced immunosuppression. So if there were any contaminants at all in any of those vaccines, these people could have gotten the illness just from the vaccine. We could have given it to them. And this may be why some of the forces deployed to Bosnia are coming down with what looks like Gulf War illness without the Gulf War. The only thing that's the same, the vaccines. Okay, but they could have gotten it uh, from uh, Iraqi uh, stores because the Iraqis had these types of things as offensive biological warfare agents, and we know that from the Iraqis themselves, that they had a number of different uh, fast-acting and slow-acting biologic agents. Fast-acting would be something like anthrax, which would kill within seven days. They also had incapacitating agents, which are not meant to kill, but are slow-acting, and remember when Saddam Hussein said he was going to carry the war back to America. So one of the things that uh, we found from talking to the Iraqis themselves was that they had a variety of different slow-acting biologic agents that they mixed in with their chemical agents. And some of these could have been released by destruction of the bunkers. Uh, one of the things that people don't know about is that there were some 50 to 60 Italian-made biological weapon sprayers that were fully deployed in southern Iraq and Kuwait. And nobody talks about this. Nobody wants to mention this. The, the colonel up here at Fort Baker who blew the whistle on this, it came out one night and then all of a sudden there was a complete news blackout on this information. He retired very shortly thereafter because he knew his number was up. 
Um, also, some of the Scuds were equipped with a typical Soviet-designed uh, airburst or skyburst warhead. And the, only, the, the only reason you use that type of warhead is to deliver an unconventional weapon, a chemical or biologic weapon. One of the, the, Marine, the Marine Commandant in CINCOM headquarters who came down with Gulf War illness and then his whole family came down and uh, gave me this map just after he retired uh, from Camp Pendleton as a full colonel. And he knew something was going wrong, but you know, he couldn't tell me at the time. Uh, this shows the impact sites of the high explosive Scud warheads shown in this explosive diagram and the airburst warhead shown as the smaller explosion with the purple cloud around it. Now the purple cloud is Prussian blue. Uh, that's a, a well-known agent that's put into a Soviet-style cocktail to defeat the HEPA filters in the mass that our soldiers were wearing over there. So if you're going to deliver chemical and biologic weapons, you deliver them with a chemical that defeats the filters in the mass. And that's exactly what it, what it was. And in fact, there, we've talked to some other people who were there. And they said, oh yeah, Prussian blue was there. We could detect it. We knew it was there. And why all the secrecy about this? Well, it was the origin of the Prussian blue. It all came from a country, uh, pardon me, a plant that was right outside of Boca Raton, Florida. So it was produced in the United States and sold to the Iraqis, mostly during the Iranian War. And of course, that becomes a real political embarrassment to think that they would use it on us after we help them. So, uh, so there are a lot of disgusting things that happen. And we've been trying to develop tests for a number of different uh, chronic infections that we feel uh, will, will be important. And notice number 13 out here, you're going to hear more about that. Uh, I didn't have time to, to talk about that, but you'll hear more about it today. And I just want to skip by the conclusions because I've taken too much time. If you want the publications that back up what I've been saying, they're on our website. And this is our website. And almost all of them are posted on the website, so you can download them. Uh, we've had uh, about 20 publications in this topic within the last several years. And the most recent ones being in infectious disease journals. And I put a couple of the reviews in the handouts that I think were passed around just to give you some background information. But, but they're not, those aren't the primary sources of the information. Some of that's cited in those reviews. Now, I don't want to leave you with the impression that I'm uh, unnecessarily pessimistic about this whole area. Quite the contrary. Um, I think that uh, we have a bright future ahead of us because at least we have some idea of the problem. We still don't know the magnitude of the problem, but we have some idea of, of the problem. And for those of you uh, practitioners out there that are going out and seeing patients that have these chronic illnesses, I, I think you're in the front lines because I think you more than anybody are going to see these chronic patients coming into your clinics with unbelievable dental problems. In fact, most of the chronic illness patients that we've worked with have had uh, multiple dental problems, uh, root canals, cavitations, but I went through this myself, so I, I know that it's a major problem. These types of infections can cause major havoc in the bone in particular. All these uh, borderline anaerobes, if they get in the bone, they can survive in the bone even without, as I mentioned, an adequate blood supply because of the very nature that, that they don't require a high level of oxygen to survive. And that's one of the reasons why we're trying to use high oxygen, elevated oxygen to try and suppress them because they don't like elevated oxygen. Uh, so be sure in your practice to, to use a lot of uh, oxygen if you can in, in these patients to hopefully uh, uh, suppress uh, these types of infections. So if, I don't know if you have question and answer periods, but I think I'm, I'm through here so you can turn on the lights. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we'll start over here in the back. Um, one of the things you mentioned briefly is like kind of a, to, to understand the criteria for what was happening here was comparing to healthy population. And, and you know, obviously there wasn't time to show all that, but I'd be curious to know how much differential is there between a supposed healthy, normal person? And if you take, uh, let's say, take fibromyalgia patients, 70% are positive. Uh, the overwhelming majority of these have multiple mycoplasmal infections. If you look at the general population, you find about 5% are positive. None of them to, so far have had multiple infections. So you can find some carriers of a single species of mycoplasma in the general population. Generally, they, to our knowledge, they're not multiple carriers. So again, I think it's a, we, we talked to, and you deal with things like tox, the, the theory of toxic load or the concept of toxic load. I, I think the same thing holds when we talk about infections. 
there is a toxic load of infections. The people that are chronically ill have a lot of these different types of infections and even a, a general class, one class like mycoplasmal infections. You have multiple species. So this tends to build up with time. If we looked at, at patients, for example, who have been sick over a decade of illness, they inevitably had multiple species of mycoplasma and as you went down to less and less time that they've been sick, you went down to, from multiple down to double and down to single and down to none. Uh, with the patients who were, who were um, uh, asymptomatic. So uh, again, I think uh, going back to this concept of, of multiple infections, uh, I think this is a major problem and I think this is what's going to occupy our attention for quite a while. Yeah, here in the back. Is the same magnitude in Mexico and France? Yes, it is. In Britain it is, but in France it's not. In Britain, uh, about the same percentage uh, came down with Gulf War illness as in the U.S. forces. Uh, we've uh, looked at British uh, veterans. They have about the same percentage of mycoplasmal infections as the U.S. forces. Their family members, about the same incidence of uh, illness in the families. This is all just being looked at now. In fact, more aggressively in Britain than it is here in the U.S., particularly the family members. So I think that will turn out to be true. In France, no. The French uh, did not show a high incidence uh, of uh, these types of uh, problems. Now, there are a couple reasons for that. Number one, the, the French were deployed far on the flank uh, outside of the areas of most of the toxic exposures, but they used a completely different strategy for protection against biological warfare. They used prophylactic antibiotics, for example, and relied more on, on uh, specialized protection gear than the US, British, and other forces. So there were a number of differences there, but the French did not show the same number of casualties. Yeah, I also heard that the you mentioned. Uh, I also heard that the French didn't have the vaccination. That's correct. They used prophylactic antibiotics instead of the vaccines to protect their forces. So they had a different strategy of protection. And this is what we've been hammering the Defense Department with with their current anthrax vaccination program. Uh, don't get me off on that because some bases there, 30 to 60 percent of people are showing adverse chronic uh, effects because of these and some are coming down with chronic illnesses uh, like uh, rheumatoid arthritis, autoimmune illnesses and so on and so forth because of these uh, vaccines uh, that are not FDA approved. I don't care what they say. Uh, you look at our papers and we'd like to challenge them on this. They claim that the vaccines they're using, the anthrax vaccine in particular, is an FDA approved vaccine. Wrong. That vaccine was approved in 1970 before the FDA approved vaccines, two years before they approved vaccines. It was never approved by the FDA. The FDA gave them a waiver on it uh, in 1986, I believe. So uh, there's a lot of disinformation out about a lot of this. Uh, okay, now I promise to the back there one. Yes, sir. You, uh, early in your presentation, you talked about two types of infections. There's 100% in ALS. Oh, patients. yes, okay. Uh, one is uh, enterovirus infection and the other is mycoplasma infection. Uh, both of these are greater than 90%. In the case of mycoplasma, it's 100%. There are two papers on the enterovirus infection as, as being about 90%. So we think that those get together and invade uh, the uh, particular nerves that are at risk in ALS. And uh, we're not sure why that happens. In, in ALS patients, and it may have something to do with their genetics as well. But that's what we've found. So far, every Gulf War veteran we've looked at has got the same scenario, so, that has ALS. What's, what's that? It's, I'm saying it's an enterovirus because there could be several uh, species of enterovirus that are involved, and I don't want to be pinned down on which species of enterovirus. Uh, let's take the front. Well, in fact, we worked with Bill Ray on autologous vaccine, and I think autologous vaccines can be very useful as one of the modalities of therapy. And, and I think uh, perhaps you also have some knowledge of this. But in working with Bill Ray, uh, that's one of the things that we were able to do, for example, with some British Gulf War veterans, was take their own white blood cells, isolate the fraction that we knew contained the mycoplasma using our molecular probes, use, making that into an image and putting that back in the patient, and they had very good responses. Now, in some cases, we couldn't sustain those responses, and they ultimately went back on antibiotics, but in other cases, they could. So I think that's a, that might be a useful, a useful approach. 
Yes, if you had, a, if you had a, a child today, would you have them vaccinated with conventional vaccines? <laughs> uh, I wish you hadn't asked me that question because we're, the, uh, the ABC News group came by, uh, and you may have seen, seen us on ABC News on that, and we, we looked at a group of children in uh, San Luis Obispo County, which is not that far from here actually, and these were children that were exhibiting um, attention deficit disorder and autism after uh, they'd received their vaccines. And so we examined those children and, and practically all of them had evidence of these types of infections. Those children were put on antibiotics, in this case azith azithromycin, not doxycycline, because most of them were too young for doxycycline, and they recovered. In fact, that's why the, the news program was there, because they were showing the kids who were now playing and interacting and not showing any of the, the problems. So, uh, I think this is a major catastrophe, actually, and we're seeing it more and more. We're having more and more people come to us whose children were vaccinated, and now all of a sudden after the vaccines, they have chronic illness problems. And you get a slightly different type of scenario with the children with this business of attention deficit disorder and autism and these other psychological problems that are quite apparent. But they also have medical problems that you can see as related to infectious disease as well. It's not that these children just have autism or just have attention deficit disorder. And I think that's the key. They also show uh, uh, signs and symptoms that would suggest that they have chronic infections as well. Yes, just go, we're going across here in the back. Uh, Gus, um, many of us here believe that the inner environment, like the presence of toxins and so forth is important as a cofactor for an infection uh, to grow. Yeah, how, I mentioned that. Yeah. How, how sensitive you think we are, like, for example, when we fly in a plane, I mean, would you go as far as saying every time you fly in a plane you should take prophylactic antibiotics? I mean, well, to be just all I can tell you is, uh, let me explain it in another way. Let me answer your question in another way without getting tied into that. Uh, I'm working with the Airline Pilots Association because a lot of pilots have problems with chronic illness. And so we're trying to figure out what types of infections they have, and what types of uh, modalities we can use to treat them, and what types of conditions can they perform their jobs in the cockpit. Now obviously they are a little bit different situation. They have oxygen available to them. They have other things that they can do. So it, it is, flying is a, is a principal problem. And a lot of the, the, uh, the, the veterans that we deal with, for example, were helicopter pilots and this and that. And I think people that fly at low oxygen tension or low oxygen partial pressure, like an unpressurized aircraft, like helicopters, are at high risk for these types of uh, borderline anaerobic infections because it just seems to stimulate these infections. Okay, we're working our way across. Yes, ma'am. A couple of questions. Did you measure natural killer cell function and number in all these patients, and was there any difference between those 50% of drugs and infections and the 40% who have the illness that did not show you? We're just starting to do this now, and there are abnormalities in NK activity. We haven't uh, actually gone back and looked at NK cells to see if somehow something's affecting their activity, but either you find abnormally high or abnormally low outside of the normal range activity in these patients. Yes, so there, is ab there are abnormalities. In, in some, now, when, when, when I say have the infection, remember, we're only looking at generally one or two classes or a few classes of infection. You can't rule out that the other, many of the other patients that we work with have unidentifiable infections. It's just that we haven't either found those infections or whatever. And you know, this list that was passed out earlier, I, I really have to say that this you know, is an amazing list associated with uh, dental problems. And in fact, when you look at at the types or the numbers of different types of infections that can occur in these, in these scenarios, you, you, you've got to be struck by the fact that uh, we live in a very, very nasty world. And a lot of these infections can get in and take hold, and we may never be able to identify all of them. I think what, what we've kind of done is just simply, uh, it's a tip of the iceberg, and it's a warning sign, and it's a signal that goes off and tells you that, look, these infections could be present and they could play a major role in a lot of these chronic illnesses. Well, we're not talking about the rest of their lives. Most people in general that we work with 
uh, tend to recover, not all of them, but tend to recover, but it can take a long time. Uh, and, and that's just a fact of life. Now we're trying other modalities to try and speed that up and trying to get away from prolonged antibiotic use. We're looking at a number of different nutraceuticals. We're looking at oxygen therapy. We're looking at a number of different ways, you know, immune therapy to, to get around this long-term antibiotic use. But right now, today, if, if you had this infection, we'd say, look, the best way to treat it is long-term antibiotics, immune support, uh, the proper vitamins and minerals and so on, and maybe oxygen therapy to a certain degree and so on. As we go on in time, I think we'll get better and better and we'll, there'll be more and more variety of different ways of approaching this problem. Behind you. Well, the first six months we say no cycles at all. Treat now uh, without stopping the first six months uh, because what we published, very few patients recovered in that six month period. From six, beyond six months, we say go on six week cycles with a two week cycle in between. And uh, a lot of patients will relapse within that two weeks. You put them back on another cycle or whenever they relapse. So you know to, you know to continue on. But you have to have some, pl some way to, to know when to stop. And it's not just are they recovering because some patients will get to a plateau phase. They'll get to a certain level and then you can't seem to get them any further. And what I'd say, well, this would be the non-infectious disease or at least this type of infectious disease part of their illness. So some people, for example, let's say they have mercury fillings or whatever that's keeping them sick and they get to a certain level and we can deal with some of the infections, but then unless you take care of the rest of it, they're not going to recover the rest of the way. Yes? Uh, yes, they have, but that, the only thing that seems to do is it takes care of the, the mycoplasma in the blood, and I think 99.999, whatever percent, it's in the tissues, not in the blood. The only thing we really use the blood for is a diagnostic purpose, because it's, uh, it's the easiest way to get a sample, a tissue sample from a person, is to get a blood sample. A and we find it in, inside the white blood cells. Now, we've taken tissue biopsies, uh, usually from surgical patients, and those show evidence uh, of the infection. And we, by the way, we've seen some biopsies where patients are cycling in their blood, but they show pretty sustained levels in their tissues. Now I interpret that as the fact that perhaps uh, there may be changes in the immune system enough to suppress it when you see it in the blood, but it's still there in the tissues inside. So we have a lot to learn about this, but I think uh, overwhelmingly it's in the tissues, not in the blood. And so that's why I really haven't recommended uh, blood irradiation. I don't think it's going to do that much for the tissue. Well, I sort of understand it, but uh, it's, it's not my department, so I turn that over to my physician colleagues to deal with, and I, I've got so many other things I have to deal with that I can't handle it, frankly. Uh, yeah, a lot of them uh, do, and again, for different types of diagnoses and different patients and different categories, uh, it, it all seems to be different. In, in dealing, for example, with the state of California, they have different the criteria and different things than, than dealing with the federal government, for example, the VA and so on. So um, uh, that's a kind of a minefield that I try and avoid getting involved in. <laughs> yes, up in the front. Uh, one We haven't tried transfer factor, but other people have with mixed results. So that may be the transfer factor they've used or whatever, but theoretically uh, this uh, should be uh, beneficial to patients. I don't think it's been tried in, in an appropriate uh, clinical trial. But the transfer factor used is not a antigen specific one, it's a high villain. I mean, specific Well, we're, we're actually not doing transfer factors, so you're asking the wrong person. I would turn that back and say that the people that are involved in transfer factor probably need to get involved in these sorts of things. Yeah. And uh, once they get involved and they see the importance of this, and maybe we'll get those trials done and we'll see something there that's useful. The other thing is, have they considered using the right concept of the frequencies? Um, that's that's uh, been used, and theoretically uh, that might be very useful depending upon how it's used. If it's just used, for example, on blood, again, we're back to the other thing we were talking about, blood irradiation. I don't think that's no, the, no, the that's ticket. Right. But if it's okay, but if you're talking about using it in tissues and you can get the right wavelength uh, frequency, uh, potentially, yes, it's going to be very useful. Now, the problem with mycoplasma is.
from the physicist friends of mine that I talk to is the frequencies are so close to our normal frequencies in our tissues that makes the, the most appropriate frequencies uh, not usable. In other words, if you just had a tube of mycoplasma, you could knock them out nothing flat. When you put those in humans and you can't use certain frequencies and you have to use secondary frequencies, it's not as effective. Now, maybe there are ways around that. Now, behind you. Uh, two questions. One, uh, have you looked at the uh, bones other than the jaw in some Yes, we have. But working with an orthopedic surgeon, for example, we're very interested in back pain because if you, uh, for example, somebody has chronic back pain, if you take a biopsy, uh, from uh, their back and you identify these infections and, and treat them, they, they almost, the pain almost goes away very quickly. And so uh, we've had some pretty good luck uh, working with uh, orthopedic surgeons on that. So it's not just uh, dental problems. There are other types of problems as well. And the other question, have you looked at, because it's an oxygen We haven't looked at people with elevation. I, I, I mentioned that we're interested in, in pilots and so on that, that fly at uh, low oxygen partial pressure. And of course, uh, in, our, in our hyperbaric treatment center, we're going to be uh, looking at just the opposite of treating, you know, treating people with high oxygen and high pressure and uh, see how that suppresses the infection. So we'll be doing things like this. We haven't done it yet. There was a question over here, and I think we're. Oh, we, yeah, we dealt with that. Well, there are a lot of things that would be better if, if we had the, the clinical trials to support their effectiveness on it. And, and I, I welcome anybody that's in this area to do it because we need more than what we have now to treat this problem. This is a horrendous problem. And uh, I think that's... Yeah, and, and, the, and same with antibiotics and other things as well. I think what we have to, to come up with eventually uh, are numbers of different uh, types of therapeutic approaches or different types of therapeutic approaches so we can tailor into individual patients' uh, needs. And I think that's the way it's going, and uh, I think that will, that will help us a lot. Okay, any, any other? There are a couple more last questions. Yes, sir. Can I make it clear? Okay. Uh, what's the risk of exposure to dentists who deal with these local infection therapies? Uh, I'm glad you brought that up because I've had a few uh, dentists call me and ask me about the uh, risk because they've seen the publications, they want to know about these things. Are they airborne? Yes, these are airborne infections. Can you aerosolize these, for example, during dental procedures? I assume you can, because a lot of things are flying around. Uh, I recommend face shield, for example, to, to stop some of it. I don't know if you can stop it all. Uh, probably the best thing to do is to try and keep your immune system uh, in good working order. And then if you start to have any chronic signs and symptoms, then you need to investigate the possibility you might have these infections yourselves by getting tested by us. And I left some information in the back of the room about that. So you should be very aware that these infections are out there, that your patients can have these, potentially have these types of infections, and you could potentially get these infections from your patients or pass them to other patients, which is even worse in a way than getting them yourself. But you just have to be aware of that. Yes? Well, we're again, we're, we're advising, I, I, you know, we're just getting involved in this. I'm advising the Department of Defense on this right now. And there, there, there are no set guidelines, but we're trying to work with the dentists that work with the Department of Defense on this issue for Gulf War illness patients because it's a major problem and they are at high risk. That's all I can tell you at the moment. And the, our, our speaker, our wonderful speaker from this morning. Yes, sir. Thank you. I want to repeat that Dr. Rosenau, from 1915 to 1928, listed 174 chronic degenerative, degenerative diseases that came from teeth. We know that once the tooth has a root canal, those teeth always remain infected, no matter how good they look or how good they feel. So your success with a certain number of cases is fine as long as they don't have a root canal. But if they have a root canal, you're not going to get success because they have the same kind of degenerative diseases you're suffering. Your, your, your point is very well taken. And I can tell you from my own experience, because I've had four root canals and I've gone through a scraping of uh, my jaw bone and where I had a cavitation because of uh, infection and so on. So I've been through it myself and I absolutely agree with you that that is, uh, I think, a very, very important area that needs more attention. 
Thank you. Yes. Last question, because I'm, I'm going like to get killed. I would like the Department of Defense's uh, uh, dentistry uh, staff. Uh, how open-minded are they as to uh, as to listen to what biological dentistry has to tell them through you? Well, I can tell you that they weren't very open-minded at first, and then the problem got to be so horrendous that they started uh, paying attention, and then when they started to get sick themselves, they paid more attention. Schedule-wise, Dr. Gordon is next, but how about a 20-minute uh, break? Okay, 20 minutes. So we'll start at 4:20 for the next, the last lecture of the day. <laughs>